you're wondering if uh, nowadays there are robots that were inspired by animals, I've got you covered. Cockroaches. Love them or not, they're here to stay. Look at those legs and hard shell they've got. They give me the creeps. But they've been around for 400 million years, so I guess they're not going anywhere. They're also incredibly fast. Well, for insects. It will take them about an hour to run three miles, and that's pretty impressive for uh, an animal of that size. Not only that, but uh, put them underwater and they'll hold their breath for up to 40 minutes. Got a tiny hole? They'll fit in there because of their malleable body and apparently at the speed of light too. Groove! There they go! Their adaptation power is so strong that you can press them with 900 times their body weight and there won't even be a scratch on their shells. Ask anyone. These things are hard to get rid of. It's no wonder scientists would want to make a robot similar to a cockroach. They sound almost invincible. Researchers at UC Berkeley did exactly that. They created CRAM which stands for Compressible Robot with Articulated Mechanisms. It's a robot the size of your palm designed to do the same incredible things cockroaches do. It has jointed plastic shell so it can squeeze into places too. Its main purpose is search and rescue missions. Off you go, you little robotic roach. Still on tiny animals. NASA has taken inspiration from a war. They might be at the bottom of the food chain, but not their robotic twins. It's meant to explore the frozen places humans can't go to, specifically in Antarctica or Mount Erebus. I feel cold just thinking about it. It doesn't move exactly like a worm though. It has two screws attached to both its ends, and it screws itself to the wall every time it wants to move. But here's what makes it special. Every time it's screwed to a wall, it collects data. NASA believes it can be further improved for space exploration. I guess it wouldn't be an ice war anymore, it'd be more like a space war? And also the first worm to ever go to space. Don't forget your space helmet. Going down in caves, we find bats. Looking like vampires after they've shapeshifted, sleeping upside down, hanging from literal rocks. Look at those gorgeous black wings. Mysterious, yet fascinating. I present to you the Badbot. No, not the Batmobile, the Badbot. It's a robotic bat. It doesn't weigh very much, and it's not very big, but it sure is impressive. Its wings replicate the elasticity of regular bat wings. The team developing this robot had to create a custom silicon membrane just for this. These bat robots are very energy efficient too, which probably means that they can fly for a long time. Sort of like the sustainable flight real bats have. Let's take to the oceans now. And this robot you're looking at is a fish. And guess what? It lives next to the real fish as well. It's called Sofi, and it's very similar looking to a fish. It's made half out of silicon and rubber and half out of electronics. The front is 3D printed and it's where all the electronics are. The best part of its construction is that it can bump against anything and not be damaged or hurt any marine life forms. Still, it's probably not a good thing if it goes around just headbutting other fish. That seems quite rude. Okay, here's something interesting. The way to control this robot is with a Super Nintendo controller. So if you're into video games like me, you'd love this. And if you're wondering how it doesn't just sink to the bottom of the ocean, that's because it has a buoyancy control unit aboard. This allows whoever is controlling it to decide whether it rises or sinks. Oh, and to top it all off and complete the look, SoFi Robot has a fisheye lens at its front. Cheetahs run very fast at about 65 to 70 miles per hour. Look at it go! It's the fastest animal on Earth. 
put it against a really fast car and it might even reach 0 to 60 miles per hour faster. 3, 2, 1, go! Yep, that's fast alright. Still, one thing we still haven't seen Cheetahs do is a backflip. This robot has us covered. Here's the Cheetah 3. It is supposedly indestructible and it does backflips too. It was mostly built so scientists could experiment crazy things on it and it does look like a cheetah so the name is appropriate. It doesn't run as fast though, 10 miles per hour to be exact. Okay so it can't race cars but it can backflip so one point to the regular cheetah and one point to the robotic one. I guess they're even. This next one is inspired by snakes. Yes, those slimy hissy fellas. It's called the Snake Robot and again, its purpose is search and rescue missions. It moves like a snake and it climbs trees just like a snake would by wrapping itself around them. It's already been used to search collapsed buildings after strong earthquakes. Since it's small and can move in any direction, it's perfect to fit into tight spots. Instead of two googly eyes, this robot has one camera in the front, so whoever's controlling it can look at its surroundings. If you're into spiders, but are still kind of afraid of them, like me, there's a solution. The Robactix T8X. It's more of a toy than anything else. You can control it and program it to do whatever you feel like. Move it around and make it dance with its tiny little legs. There's two versions of it, a hairy one and a smooth one. The hairy one probably resembles a tarantula. My name is Tom, thank you for watching and remember, let's become smarter every day together with Brightside. The Liger is probably the most popular hybrid animal and an incredibly large cat. You won't see them in the wild. People most deliberately breed them. Lions and tigers don't even inhabit the same areas. So, a Liger is a mix of a male lion and a female tiger, and they can grow to be very big in a pretty short period of time. They're actually the biggest cats in the world. Hercules, the largest recorded Liger, is a real example of that. 922 pounds and 10.8 feet long. Imagine taking him for a walk. Ligers are mostly way bigger than either of their parents. In most cases, they behave and look more like lions than tigers. But they have some tiger traits too. For example, striped backs, and they're crazy about swimming. The Tigan. Nobody could fault you for thinking the Tigan and Liger are basically the same animal. I mean, they're both a combination of tigers and lions, but a tigan comes from a crossbreeding of a male tiger and a female lion. They're usually smaller than their parents, and definitely much smaller than their giant, could you call them siblings? In most cases, they inherit charming looks from their tiger fathers, but they get some interesting traits from their mother's side too. For example, love for socialization and the ability to roar. Hands down, one of the rarest hybrid animals in the world are wolfins. These fellas are a mashup of a female bottlenose dolphin and a male false killer whale. Its name might make you think differently, but a false killer whale belongs to the dolphin family. They're not even related to killer whales. Wolfins are such an interesting 50-50 mix and balance of their parents. They have dark gray skin, the perfect blend of a black false killer whale and light gray dolphin skin. Dolphins have anywhere between 80 and 100 teeth. False killer whales have 44. And their hybrid young is halfway, with 66 teeth in total. What would it look like if algae and a slug paired? No need to imagine. You have a green sea slug to check the result. It lives in salt marshes in Canada and New England. And it's possibly the weirdest hybrid creature you'll see in this video, and in general. Part plant, part animal. So, some slugs seem to have been very sneaky while stealing the genes from innocent algae that they have eaten to enable them to look like this. Since they're partially a plant, they can produce the plant pigment called chlorophyll. 
That means these unusual slugs can even photosynthesize. That's the process plants use to turn sunlight into energy. So they produce their own molecules that contain energy without having to eat anything at all. When scientists first discovered it, a green sea slug was the first case of a multicellular animal that's able to produce chlorophyll. What do you get when you mix a male leopard and a female lion? You get an interesting hybrid called a lepin. These animals grow to be almost as big as lions, but they still have shorter legs, similar to their father leopard. They inherit some of his other traits too, like a love for climbing and swimming. You can have a union with a male lion and a female leopard too, and the result is called a leopard. Male lions are usually around 10 feet long and weigh about 500 pounds. The female leopard is way smaller, only 5 feet long with a weight of about 80 pounds. The difference in size here is too big, so this pairing really doesn't happen that often. Okay, how about a buffalo and a cow? When you were little, maybe you thought that they could be a good match. But in reality, the combination creates an unusual hybrid animal called a beefalo. Not many types of hybrid animals can reproduce on their own, but a beefalo can do it. When a grizzly and a polar bear get together, it results in a growler bear, or pizzly bear, or grizzlar, whichever you like the most. You can see them even in the wild. These two types of bears have a mutual contempt for one another. Yep, they're not good at living together in a mutual habitat. But even though it's rare, the love can still happen and result in these cute caramel-colored hybrid growler bears. In most cases, they'll be a bit smaller than polar bears, on average 60 inches tall at the shoulder, and approximate weight 1,000 pounds. But they're well equipped for surviving in warmer climates, thanks to the genes they got from their grizzly family side. Now let's get to one pretty tough fella, the jag lion. As its name implies, it's the hybrid of a jaguar and a lion. We don't know much about these intriguing big cats because only a few of them exist. But there was an unintentional mixing between a black jaguar and a lioness, which eventually resulted in two jag lion cubs. One had a dark gray coat with black spots because of the dominant melanin gene black jaguars usually have. The other one had a lion color and the rosette pattern spots that remind you of a jaguar. Yep, you already know it. There are also liguars, a hybrid of a female jaguar and a male lion. That's some colorful family. Speaking of wild cats, have you ever heard of a savanna cat? Savanna cats are in both categories of house pets and exotic hybrids, since they're a mix of a domestic cat and a wild African serval hybrid animal. We're talking about striking animals, almost as big as a domestic cat. But what gives them their exotic look are their tall bodies, slender forms, and spotted coats. These cats are extremely loyal, intelligent, and loving creatures. Here's one unexpected mixture, a zebroid. Technically, it's a name people use to describe a hybrid of a zebra and any equine species. But when you pair a zebra and a horse, their young is called a zorse. Zebra hybrids mostly look like whichever animals they've been crossbred with, but with the striped coat of a pure zebra. Most of these hybrid creatures don't even have fully striped coats. You can mostly see the stripes on non-white areas of their bodies and legs. Speaking of zebra hybrids, check out this adorable creature. It's called a zonkey, or zedonk, zebras, zanki, eh, take your pick. They're mostly either tan, gray, or brown in color. You'll distinguish them by unique stripes that are darkest on their legs and belly. Unlike some hybrids, such as the liger, zonkeys can normally live in the wild. In fact, that's where you can find them, living life to the fullest across savannas and open woodland, mostly in Africa. Can you guess what a geep is? <laughs> yep, a combination of goat and sheep, and definitely one of the most adorable and cuddliest hybrid creatures in this video. Geeps are very rare. Some experts even believe it's possible that they're not true hybrids, but just sheep with certain genetic abnormalities. After all, sheep and goats do carry different numbers of chromosomes, which means cross-species mixes are almost impossible. When a camel and a llama get together, you get a cute little thing called a kama. Similar to beefalo, the kama also produces the best economic traits of both its parents. The first one was born in 1998. 
commas don't have camel humps. Their body is covered in soft, fleecy fur, similar to their llama side of the family. They can drink big amounts of water at a time, so they can survive with almost no water at all for pretty long periods. The koi wolf is a hybrid where nothing looks that unusual to most people, since the coyote and the wolf are not that drastically different in their looks. After all, these two species only diverged around 200,000 years ago. Now they're still able to mate and bring koi wolf cubs to the world. People living in eastern Canada and the US might be familiar with these smart adaptable animals that inhabit their forests, neighborhood parks, or sometimes even cities. These hybrids have emerged over the past century or so. And they've picked up the characteristics of both their parents. When a koi wolf is fully grown, it's somewhere in between the size of both parents. But it's also 55 pounds heavier than pure coyotes, and has a bigger jaw, longer legs, smaller ears, and a bushier tail. Check out the narluga, an extremely rare creature whose parents are a narwhal and a beluga whale. It's a pretty strange animal, but far from being lonely, they mostly live in the North Atlantic. Scientists had suspected their existence for decades. In 1990, they found an unusual-looking whale skull located in an Inuit hunter's tool shed in Greenland. People from that area said that there were other similar-looking animals, and they fit the description of neither a beluga whale nor a narwhal. People said they had gray skin, narwhal-like tails, and beluga-like flippers. Narwhals and beluga whales are similar in size, and they share a family, the Monodontidae family. So it may not even be that surprising that they're able to successfully breed in the wild. Psst, run. Really, it's not safe out there. There's a saber-toothed tiger looking around. You better be careful. What are you doing? Don't peek. Okay, just one little peek. How's this possible, you ask? That's because you're in virtual reality, of course. These cool but very dangerous-looking big cats were alive during the last ice age. What if they decided to show up at your doorstep out of nowhere? Knock knock! A saber-toothed tiger is waiting for you to buy its cookies. Meanwhile, the coelacanth, this massive-looking fish, comes from a lineage that's been around for over 300 million years. We thought they didn't exist anymore until 1938, that is, when a live coelacanth was found again. Since then, they've been roaming the waters of the east coast of Africa and the waters of Sulawesi, Indonesia. Man, I wouldn't want to go for a swim and meet one of these fellas face to face. Their jaw has an intracranial joint, which means their mouth opens up by a lot. This is so they can eat large prey, like me. Not good. They're huge, too. Imagine a fish that's as long as you're tall and weighing as much as an average human. The Takahe, a flightless bird, was thought to be gone in the year 1898. They're very cute, small and multicolored, usually not taller than your knee. But picture this. You're out for a hike in the Murkison Mountains. Looking around, you spot the bird you thought was extinct. But there they are, as happy as ever, surviving and chilling. A whole colonies of Takahe's was indeed found just 50 years after they were pronounced extinct. Good job, tiny little birds! A singing dog. Ever heard of those? Riley does sing sometimes when he's bored or hungry, but these are real performers. New Guinea singing dogs. They've been only recently discovered again in the wild for the first time in 50 years. Still, they were never completely extinct to begin with. New Guineans made sure they were safe next to them. But in the wild? Very rare and hard to catch a sight of. Look, there goes one! The New Guinea singing dogs are called so because of their famous high-pitched singing. They sometimes sing together, too. A dog choir of sorts, where they all howl together. I bet they sing better than I do in the shower. Not going far from this area, we have bats. But these ones are sort of different. You see, their ears are enormous. I guess that's why they're called the New Guinea big-eared bats. Clever. The species was found again when one of them was accidentally caught in a bat trap. Until then, I guess they were playing hide-and-seek with us, because up till 1890, they had been thought to be gone. They're still not out of the danger zone because of habitat loss. 
Imagine you discover a fossil of a species you thought had been extinct for a long time. Yet, two years later, a whole living group of said species is found. Well, this is exactly what happened in 1977 with the Majorcan midwife toad. It's sort of brownish in color with darker brown that makes up its skin spots. Other than that, it's just a small toad with googly eyes. The group of live toads was found close to where the fossil was on the island of Majorca. There aren't many of them left, about 500 in fact, and as of right now, they're declared vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Now, are you a fan of tortoises? You will be when you take a look at this huge beauty. It's called the Ferdinanda Island Galapagos tortoise. It hasn't been seen since 1906. But on February 17, 2019, we were finally able to look at one of these beautiful creatures. It's probably out there with a few of its mates right now, but they also don't allow themselves to be seen. We only know they exist because there's a few tracks and scents. With yet another frog, we have the horned marsupial frog. They're out and about in Ecuador, in the Chaco Forest to be more specific. They're called this way because of their distinctive horns directly on top of their eyes. You know the pouch kangaroos use to carry their offspring? Well, the female horned marsupial frog also has that, except it's on the back, so it acts as sort of a backpack. They develop their embryos there, and when they're ready to come out, they hatch as complete infants, unlike regular frogs where they start out as tadpoles. One more toad, the starry night toad or harlequin toad. They're black and covered with loads of white spots all over them. Lost for 30 years, it was discovered back in 2019. Picture them as big bodyguards, water bodyguards to be exact. Oh, that's a very big toad on your screen. Well, for the Arawako people, that's exactly what they are, guardians of water. They also have their own name for them, guna. Sounds like a cheese. When scientists found them yet again, they came across 30 of these little creatures. But initially, they were expecting only one. Well, what a nice surprise. Here's a tiger for you, although it doesn't quite look like your typical tiger. It's called the Tasmanian tiger, and it seemingly disappeared since 1936. But then, out of nowhere, people started seeing them out there in the wild just five years ago in 2016. They sort of resemble dogs more than tigers, or a fox maybe. Just take a look at its muzzle. Maybe even a mix of both. Then, a few others started popping up too. And if you happen to think you're seeing one right in front of you, but you're not quite sure, check if they've got stripes on their back. They're definitely out there, but still technically marked as extinct by the IUCN. Okay, picture a horse that looks straight out of a movie scene. Tiny, gorgeous fur, very well behaved. It's tiny, but it's not a pony. It's a Caspian horse. They have an interesting backstory to them. They were discovered by Louise Leyland, who got married to an aristocrat in 1957. Having moved to Tehran, Iran, she didn't quite like how the horses behaved there, so she took matters into her own hands. She took a few people with her, and off they went to the Caspian Sea Mountain. And in there, they found three of these beautiful tiny little horses. Now well, that's how the story goes. Coming up next, a possum that was found in an unexpected place. Guess where? You have three options to pick from hiding in a ski resort, in the Australian outback, or in someone's apartment in the bathroom. Which one do you choose? You have three seconds. The right answer is a ski resort. Yes, this possum is called the mountain pygmy possum, and it's originating from Australia. So far, there are three different living populations of this tiny possum, but it was believed to be extinct until just 1966. There are fewer than 100 of them, so the IUCN has marked them as critically endangered. Also from Australia is the night parrot, an absolute delight to bird watchers. Very beautiful, yet mysterious. These little fellas live in very remote areas. 
you can probably count on the fingers of your hand how many times these birds have been seen since they were found again in 1979. That's how rare they are. Have you ever seen a pygmy tarsier? Neither have I. It was only in 2008 that three of them were caught. Scientists don't really want to lose track of their movements again, so what they did was gift them with tiny little collars. This way they can live their life as happy as ever and will know they're safe. The last one I want to tell you about is the tree lobster. But as the name might mistakenly tell you, they're not really lobsters. They're just big black bugs with huge legs. Their extinction story is a sad one. In 1920, a cargo ship got stuck on Lord Howe Island, and it had rats aboard. These rats fled the ship and ran straight to land. Even though tree lobsters are bigger than most insects, they're still relatively small compared to rats. The poor things never stood a chance. Still, in 2004, life shone again for these distinct critters. A pair of Australian scientists were out and about on the island and came across 24 of them. All of them were living beneath one single shrub. Hey, if there's enough space for everyone, it's not small, it's cozy. Bottom line, it's better to be distinct than extinct. Don't you agree? <laughs>